is David Kenny. I'm the preacher for the Church of Christ here in Wadsworth, Ohio, on Westgood Avenue. Glad you can be with us on the program today. We've been talking about some series of lessons proving the Bible is the inspired Word of God. We've pointed out, you know, the Bible doesn't have anything to fear from an honest investigation. The key word is honest. That's the thing that we're after. And we've been looking at different evidences to sustain the idea, the proposition that the Bible is not just some man-made book. Well, men were involved with it, no doubt, but that they had an influence, that, that God had an influence in the book, that it's a supernatural book, uh, that it's not just a product of men. Take, for example, look at the argument that we're making as we do this study together. The argument is, if it's the case that the Bible makes prophecy of future events that are beyond a person's ability to fulfill, and these prophecies are documentable as fulfilled, then the Bible is beyond a naturalistic influence and requires a supernatural influence, in other words, God. And number two, it is the case that the Bible makes prophecy of future events which are beyond the prophet's ability to fulfill, which are verifiably true. And that leads us to our conclusion, number three, therefore the Bible is the work of a supernatural influence, in other words, God. And that's what we've been talking about. And we've been talking about, just as a reminder, the importance of remembering what the true nature of a prophet is. You know, sometimes we tend to focus on just one aspect of it, but the work of a prophet's, prophets and the prophecies uh, were a lot larger than just foretelling of future events. If you recall this quote, we'll put it up here by Dr. Jack Lewis on the, you know, the fact that prophets were not fortune tellers. I'm not going to read that to you again, but I just want to call out a couple points from it that he makes. You know, prophets were spokesmen for someone else. Uh, a prophet of God was a spokesman for God. Uh, they, they spoke about warnings of uh, the people. Uh, they taught them things they needed to know. Uh, they would call them to repentance if they were in, in the wrong. Uh, a lot of times they talk about events that were outside of their ability to know, the prophets themselves. And a lot of times people think about, well, you know, they foretell the future, they could look into the future, but we need to keep in mind that they also looked in the past. Uh, they, could, they could look into the past and record things faithfully because, remember, uh, their message was delivered to them by God. God revealed certain things to them, and that could flow both ways. That could go to the past and to the future, and even things that were happening right then that a prophet couldn't really know, uh, he didn't have the resources to observe firsthand, he was able to foretell or tell, forth tell, certain things that were going on. So that's important to remember. Uh, indeed, the message of the prophets in regards to, uh, you know, they, they talked about things that leaders were doing that were hurting poor people or they were breaking the law and things like that. So they had a, they had a lot of messages wrapped up. They were more than just the idea uh, of fortune tellers or, or things of that kind of nation, uh, nature. Uh, you know, there are various ways in the Bible that uh, prophecies are made. You know, some prophecies you know, are direct statements and uh, direct fulfillments. Uh, there's different uh, attributes of prophets in their, in their work and their writings. And one of the things that, uh, you know, sometimes prophets are more specific about certain events, and that's what I want to talk about today. One of the you know, one of the most uh, incredible prophets is specific prophecy uh, that the Bible makes. But let me ask you, you know, how many of you baseball fans remember uh, the called shot? Uh, I brought in this book today. Uh, it's called Babe Ruth, uh, The Sultan of Swat. Um, you know, my life has been richly blessed. Uh, my wife and I have been richly blessed with two children. Uh, we have a beautiful daughter named Deborah and also a son uh, named James. And it's interesting, children... I wonder if God you know, created children for us to help us remember the things that we often forget. We're in such a hurry with the latest gadgetry or hobby or whatever. You know, sometimes you know, it's interesting just to listen to the rain or look at flowers or admire a butterfly or things of that nature. And I think children are reminders of those kinds of things in our lives. And of course, children, uh, sons are as well. And I can remember the joy of playing catch with my father and, and my son, and I need to do more of that with him, and I hope to do a lot of that in the future as well. But he let me borrow this book, uh, and it, you know, I, I always hesitate to use sports figures. I hesitate to do that. I generally don't do it if they're still alive. Uh, I wish that professional sports, the people that manage those things, would be more diligent about the kind of people they have in them. Uh, the idea that an athlete could commit a felony and have such uh, have a, a record and have be such a bad example is really deplorable. Uh, I think that they need to get back to uh, stressing personal integrity uh, in the game. 
whether that's the integrity of the player, the manager, the coaches, or whatever. Uh, it just seems like, you know, I'm very reluctant uh, to talk about a sports figure because it seems like when you talk about one, then they go and get in trouble. They get a DUI or something like that. But um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Babe Ruth. Uh, this is my son James's book that we bought for him. It's called The Sultan of Swat. And in there he talks about, um, one of the chapters talks about one of my favorite stories in baseball, and that's the called shot. And you may remember the events of it, but I thought I'd just sort of review them with you. Yeah, this is game three of the 1932 World Series. It's the New York Yankees versus the Chicago Cubs, and they're playing in Chicago. They already played the first two games in New York. Chicago had lost both of those games. And so they're playing that game. Uh, this is game three. It's on a Saturday, October 1st, 1932. Uh, the score is tied four to four. And it would be, you know, the Cubs hadn't won a World Series since 1908. And Babe Ruth is going to help make sure that they still wouldn't win a World Series. Matter of fact, I don't think they have won a World Series since 1908. They've been to the World Series, I believe, but I don't think they've won one uh, since then. And, and what was going on, you know, Babe Ruth had quite a reputation then. And people were booing him, and he would come to the plate, or he would do something, and they would be booing him. Uh, well, the fifth inning would come, and he would go to the plate. And people in the crowd would be booing him. Even the opposing players would be jeering at him as well. Uh, but he went up to the plate, and he's, you know, he lets the first pitch go right by. Matter of fact, he calls the word strike and holds his finger up uh, before the person can even uh, say it, uh, the umpire. And then you know, he does the same thing for the second pitch call strike two, you know, he makes a real big show of it. And then take a look at this picture here of, of Babe Ruth, and you can see there in the circle uh, what he does. Um, he, he basically pauses and points out to the outfield, and he does it for quite a bit of time. And people, you know, he's pointing to center field. And people debate, you know, exactly what he was doing, but there's no doubt what he was doing. He was waiting. He was calling his shot. And that pitch came across the plate, and he hit it right about where he was pointing, right through center field, right over the wall. Uh, and they would go on to win that game 7-5, to five, and they would go on and win uh, the rest of the games in New York, and they would be the 1932 uh, world champions of baseball. But, you know, we really don't necessarily remember, unless you hardcore Yankee fans out there, no offense, but we don't really remember the 1932 World Series other than that called shot. A lot of us know that. I mean, they made cartoons out of it, different things. You know, it's, it's a part of our iconic history, uh, this called shot. But you got to keep in mind, too, that, you know, the idea of a called shot, you know, God does something like that. Not only, it's not baseball, but he, does, he makes a prophecy, you know, several of them. But one I'm going to look at today, I want you to think about that idea of a called shot and take a look at the example we're going to look at. We're going to look at a prophecy in the Old Testament that really sticks out. It's a proclamation of Cyrus that he would be uh, king, and that he would be issuing a proclamation to benefit uh, the Jews. And let's take a look at the prophecy first. This is Isaiah. Um, Isaiah made this prophecy about Cyrus some 200 years prior to Cyrus coming to the throne. Now, unfortunately, you know, in our English Bibles, um, it you know, the chapter breaks interfere here. Uh, you need to keep in mind, I'm sure most of you know this, that you know, the chapter and verses, that wasn't done by Isaiah. Uh, that was done by people later, people that weren't inspired. And sometimes they do better jobs uh, of that than others. Uh, this is one of the cases when uh, they didn't do as good of a job with the chapter break. But the chapters and verses help us find uh, parts in the Bible more quickly. And here's what Isaiah wrote in Isaiah chapter 44, uh, verses 24, through chapter 45 in verse 6. And we'll read this together. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb, I am the Lord, who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself, who frustrates the signs of the babblers and drives diviners mad, who turns wise men backward and makes their knowledge foolishness, who confirms the word of his servant and performs the counsel of his messengers, who says to Jerusalem, you shall be inhabited, to the cities of Judah, you shall be built, and I'll raise up her waste places, who says to the deep, Be dry, and I will dry up your rivers? Who says of Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, You shall be built, and to the temple your foundation shall be laid? And then in chapter 45, picking up verse 1, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, 
to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to, excuse me, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places, that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel my elect, I have even called you by your name. I have named you, though you have not known me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I notice here in that passage, it talks several times, I have called you by name. I have called you by, he may say that expression more than once. And when I was thinking about that, that reminded me of that called shot of Babe Ruth. You know, he called a shot. I'm going to hit one right over center field wall. That's where it's going to go. Well, here, Isaiah is prophesying about the, up, uh, the rising kingdom and Cyrus. And he's going to make a proclamation. And he's so bold, if you will, that he's even stating, I'm going to name the person's name. I'm going to give you the name. There is nothing you're going to be able to do to stop it. This is what's going to happen. And it's interesting that he did that. Uh, and, you know, this is God calling a shot. And you've got to keep in mind that Isaiah wrote, uh, his prophecies were written before uh, the Judah was destroyed originally. So he's writing before the captivity, uh, the Babylonians would come in, uh, they would rule the empire for over 70 years, the Jews would be in captivity, and then the Medes, uh, Cyrus is a Mede and the Persians, uh, they would come and, and they would conquer the Babylonians. So when Isaiah wrote this, you know, there was still a kingdom of Judah, there was still a temple. Uh, that was going to be destroyed in the, in the captivity. All that was going to happen. And then the, uh, then the Medes would come up and Cyrus would be king. And then these things would happen. So, you know, this is, this is a significant prophecy. And what prompted, you know, what prompted Cyrus to do this? Uh, think about it. I mean, what does he care uh, about the Jews? I mean, why would he care about their God or anything like that? I mean, he's a Persian. He's not worried about it. He doesn't even worship their God. Why would he care about What would motivate him? to do such a thing. Well, let's look at Ezra chapter 1 and verse 1 together. Uh, Ezra mentions Jeremiah rather than Isaiah here. Um, you can look you know, through Jeremiah 25 and 29 to see what was written there. But notice the expression here. Uh, it says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord might, by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. Notice it says, The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. And you go on, you read, you can read the uh, proclamation that Cyrus makes there. But I want to hone in on this idea of that the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus. Well, well, how did he do that? How did God accomplish that? Did God just, you know, reach out and just force Cyrus to do something he wasn't willing to do? How did he get him to do that? You know, it's pretty incredible. What would motivate Cyrus to do such a thing? I mean, it'd be one thing if you just let them go. You know, I conquered Babylon, I got all these people. You know what, you guys just get out of here. That'd be one thing, but that's not what he did. He let them go back, and he also took money out of his own treasury to help them rebuild the temple in their city. Why would he do that? You know, that's something that's uh, is very fascinating. How did God do this if he didn't violate uh, Cyrus' free will? Well, there is a possible explanation. Uh, G, uh, Flavius Josephus provides us a possible explanation. But before we talk about uh, what that explanation is, let's sort of look at what G, Flavius Josephus, let's look at him for a moment and give you a little bit of background about who he is. He lived about 37 to 100 AD. Uh, he was a Roman Jewish historian writing and explaining many of the details of Judaism to those of the Roman Empire. He was a descendant of the high priest Jonathan, so he had a first class education. Um, he learned various religious sects of Judaism. Uh, he would eventually join the Pharisees. He was appointed governor of Galilee when the Romans came against Judah. Uh, he was captured by Thespian, and Thespian got him to agree to uh, negotiate, um, to try to mediate a dispute between the Roman Empire and Judea. Uh, however, that did not work out, uh, and uh, Josephus would actually witness the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., he would go back with Titus and, and uh, Vespian 
uh, he would go back to Rome and he would be granted Roman citizenship and he was paid an annual salary and what he did with that he wrote his works wrote a lot of his books then and these are very important works his works are very you know, even though the Romans didn't like him and the Jews hated him because they, a lot of people felt he was a traitor because he joined the Roman Empire even though he was trying to do what he thought was best for uh, the Jewish nation at the time they hated him I mean they, they viewed him as a traitor a lot of them did but his works are highly respected especially his works that he was able to see uh, he's one of the historians that records the final days of the Jewish Empire in 70 AD he was there and that's one of the things that's valuable about it but you know you should keep in mind you know Josephus is not a prophet he's a historian and that's something you need to keep in mind he doesn't have God revealing things to him what he's relying upon is the Jewish historical records he wrote a history of their people uh, he write about historical events that were happening right then uh, but there's a big difference you know the Bible is historically accurate 100 percent but that's not the only test that a, a book has to pass in order to be inspired it, you know historical accuracy is a given well Josephus is a historian so you have to be careful about taking everything that Josephus says uh, as you know as the absolute truth because he was not an inspired prophet and there is a distinction there but he does provide a possible explanation to why Cyrus was doing what he did and let's take a look uh, at this quote that what he writes in his Antiquity of the Jews and this is a little longer quote so I'm, it's going to be on two slides but it's important that we read all of it this was known to Cyrus by his reading the book which Isaiah left behind him of his prophecies for this prophet said that God had spoken thus to him in a secret vision my will is that Cyrus whom I have appointed to be king over many and great nations send back my people to their own land and build my temple this was foretold by Isaiah 140 years before the temple was demolished. In the next slide, accordingly, when Cyrus read this and admired the divine power, an earnest desire and ambition seized upon him to fulfill what was so written. So he called for the most eminent Jews that were in Babylon and said to them that he gave them leave to go back to their own country and to rebuild their city, Jerusalem, and the temple of God, for that he would be their assistant that he would write to the rulers and governors that were in the neighborhood of their country of Judea that they should contribute to them gold and silver for the building of the temple and besides that beasts for their sacrifices so it appears what happened is that you know, they brought this scroll to Cyrus they said we have this really old scroll here and it mentions you by name and he read that and he thought he's like well you know <laughs> I'm gonna do this I mean, this scroll is calling me by name. I had better do it. Or he was, you know, he was enticed to do it because of that. And so you actually have the prophecy that was written. He actually reads it, and he goes out to seek to do that. And it's interesting that he did that, but that's what happened. And that's what history back up. Um, also, you know, before we go on, this, this portion that, I, that Josephus is quoting in here, where he quotes you know, what Isaiah said, one thing you need to note, that's the latter part of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah. And if you recall from the previous program, we talked about the authorship of Isaiah. We talked about how there, some people think there's three of them. Three people wrote the book and they divide it all up. Well, here you have Josephus quoting Isaiah in what would have been the latter part of his book. But Josephus doesn't have any problem with Isaiah stating that he wrote that book at all. But we have people run around the day and say, well, you know, Isaiah didn't write that. But that's not what Josephus said. And so the question is, who's in a better position to know? Josephus of about 100 AD or somebody of, you know, 1900, you know, just, you know, not that long ago. Well, that, you know, should be pretty self-evident. But what happened? Well, we know that the Jews came back. Look at this chart I put together. You know, Cyrus issues a decree. He lets him go back. Uh, it would take him a little while to uh, obviously get organized and head back. But there would be at least three major returns. 538 BC during the days of Cyrus uh, that's recorded in Ezra chapters 1 through 6 uh, and then there uh, also in 458 BC during the days of Artaxerxes that would be recorded in Ezra chapter 7 through 10 
And then 444 BC, during the days of Artaxerxes again, uh, that would be in the book of Nehemiah. Before the end of the Persian Empire, the temple, Jerusalem, and its fortifications, and much of the cities of Judah would be rebuilt. And much of this would be financed by the Persians, that they would do that, as prophesied by Isaiah and Jeremiah. And the temple was completed on the third day of the twelfth month of Adar, uh, which doesn't really mean a lot to me, so I had to look that up. And that would be almost March 3rd, 516 B.C. That's a rough approximation of when that was. So Cyrus fulfilled what was written about him. He decided to do that. And it's interesting, archaeologists made a, a fascinating discovery called the Cyrus Cylinder. Put a picture of it for you here. Uh, it's in the British Museum in London, England right now. Uh, it was loaned to Iran uh, a few months ago, and they displayed it for a while, but now it's back uh, in the British Museum. It chronicles the conquest of Babylon by Cyrus in 539 B.C. Uh, it also has Cyrus's decree. Now, in the decree, he mentions, he doesn't mention Jehovah, he mentions his God. And some people say, well, see, that doesn't really, that doesn't match what the Bible says. But you've got to remember, you know, that doesn't prove anything. <laughs> Cyrus was, a, was an idolater. He was a polytheist. He worshipped all kinds of gods. His chief god was Marduk, and that's who he writes, I did this, Marduk, I did this, I did this. And he probably thought that, well, you know, Jehovah is a god. He's a god of the Jews, and they have the other, the, all these lesser gods, but my god is Marduk. And Marduk, I'm going to do what this god over here told me to do, and I'm going to be blessed for it. So some people say, well, this doesn't, the Cyrus Cylinder doesn't really uh, say what it says in the Bible, but they miss the point. Uh, the Cyrus Cylinder, he probably made several proclamations. And that's something that people need to keep in mind, that Cyrus was a polytheist. He worshipped all kinds of gods. Uh, and, you know, so that's something they need to keep in mind. But the question is, you know, even if, it, even if there was an issue with him not mentioning Jehovah on that cylinder and mentioning Marduk, the question is, how do you explain it? How do you explain why Cyrus did what he did? How can you explain that? It's, you know... Uh, Josephus' explanations is very plausible. Uh, it's a very good explanation of that. God called his shot by naming Cyrus by name 200 years prior. And we're not just talking about, you know, we're talking about naming him by name as the king and making the proclamation. All those events. And he wasn't even alive yet. It's pretty fascinating. Indeed, God had called his shot. You know, one more picture I want to show you relating to Cyrus. This is his tomb. It's located in Iran. Uh, it is uh, still standing. Uh, like I said, it's in modern Iran today. Uh, some sources state that it's the oldest base isolated structure in the world. Uh, and uh, you can go and visit that. Matter of fact, you go on the internet, uh, you can look at pictures of it from all kinds of different angles and other things relating to the Persian Empire and the Persian capital there. But this is a tomb, a mausoleum, uh, that is supposedly be uh, the tomb of Cyrus the Great. And so that's another uh, interesting thing relating to him. Before he goes, let's take another look at our argument. You know, if it's a case the Bible makes prophecies of future events that are beyond a person's ability to fulfill, and these prophecies are documentable as fulfilled, then the Bible is beyond a naturalistic influence and requires a supernatural influence, and that is God. And, and that's what you've got to remember here, what we have. You know, Isaiah made this statement about Cyrus. Cyrus would come after Isaiah would already have been dead. Isaiah couldn't have impacted Cyrus, you know, as far as directly that way. He did it through writing. He did it through writing his words, and Cyrus responded to it. You know, the gospel's the same way today. The gospel tells us what we need to do. You don't have to wait around for an inspired prophet to come and you know, hit you over the head or have an angel talk to you or something like that. The Bible tells you what you need to do. You just need to do it. And we hope that you will. Thanks for watching our program today. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there and sadly so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map. 
don't even open their Bibles yet and they think they're saved already. As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And that, the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind, too, that in Noah's day, there was a big flood, and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the road map to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey.